What is going on guys? Jonathan here, aka Crazy Shadow 303, here with another episode of the Halfords Lane Chat, a West Bromwich Albion fans podcast. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, I've got no guests this time. Um, there is something that we uh, we have prepared later for the team focus, um, but obviously due to availability, uh, my planned guests weren't able to join um, so hopefully next week uh, we'll get some more people in. Um, but for now, it's just me on my own. Some episodes will probably be, be like this. It depends. You know, people, you know, have got lives outside of um, social media and networking and, you know, podcasts and blogs and all that, you know. So, uh, yeah, uh, I just, um, uh, yeah, basically a few uh a few videos will be like this. A few episodes will be like this. So, yeah, um, before I get into this week's episode, you may have noticed that I'm a little bit less hairy up top. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, basically, I just decided to get my hair cut um, earlier this week. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, this is what I do when it comes to comes to my hair. You know, I wake up one morning and like, right, it's got to go. So, you know, so I, it is going to be like this at least until it grows back. Uh, so yeah, I mean, what what do you think of the new look, guys? Uh, let me know in the comments below uh, or in the live chat if you're watching the uh, the pre the premiere. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is the Halfords Lane chat. We're here uh, premiering on the Crazy Shadow Talks Football YouTube channel every Monday at seven pm. And yeah, if you like this, then please. Uh, leave a like and subscribe to Crazy Shadow Talks Football. And, you know, don't forget to hit the bell icon and join the Shadow Squad and get notified on all new content on the channel. Uh, but, yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. And we're starting today with the obvious um, Saturday's results. Uh, first home game of the Hawthorns. Of course, I was there um, doing the vlog. So after this episode... If you want to check that out, then it will be um, in the notification cards at the end of uh, this video. So, yeah, I mean, um, it was um, it was an interesting watch, to say the least, uh, from the from literally the Halford's Lane stand uh, where I was sitting. And, um, yeah, I mean, we came into this, you know, off the back of two, two, one defeats. Out of the Carabao Cup, morale was pretty low. Um, you know, players and fans were clashing at the end of the Stoke game. Um, yeah, let's go into a little bit into that because, uh, yeah, we lost 2-1 um, to Stoke. Uh, as I said, knocked out the Carabao Cup at the Bet365. And, you know, Nathaniel Chalabar did something that he probably shouldn't have done. Um, but it just wound up the Albion fans who went to the Bet365 um, last Tuesday night. And, you know, it's um, it's never good when players are arguing with fans. You know, it's um, no club wants to see that. You know, no club wants to see confrontation within its ranks, so to speak. And, you know, obviously within its support. So, yeah, I mean, Nathaniel Chalabar, he did apologise on um, on Twitter. But, you know, it's um, it's one of those, isn't it? Frustrations boil through. You know, we probably haven't had as many, um, you know, haven't prepared well for this, shall we say. Uh, we talked a lot last week with Connor from West Brom Fan TV about pre-season. Uh, I think what we didn't mention was probably the mentality of losing so many games during pre-season. Obviously, we lost the first game against Blackburn, 2-1. And, you know, that was a tough one to take, first game of the season. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to lose to Stoke as well, they consider us at their greatest rivals, you know, um, even though we don't return the favour, which we talked about in episode two last week. But, um, yeah, I mean... To lose to Stoke was, you know, a really bit of pill to swallow. Uh, they've now come up, they're coming up against Rotherham uh, at the Bet365 again. Um, and I don't know what my cat is doing. 
but yeah, um, we're um, you know they're they're facing Rotherham, so really, I tip Stoke to get to round three. Uh, if I had to choose between Stoke and Rotherham, so yeah, we uh, we could have had a chance there if things went differently. We'd have been against Rotherham at the Hawthorns, by the way, because Stoke um, has got a home tie for the second round again. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's um, it was a tough one to take. So we were coming into the Hawthorns, the first home game of the season, off the back of 2-2-1 defeats, and morale was pretty low, shall we say. Um, but yeah, I mean, it. I wasn't expecting this, uh, you know, I was expecting us to win. You know, I even predicted on Switch Radio's breakfast show last Friday that we were going to win. Um, but I only tipped us to win 2-1. Uh, never did I imagine that we'd score three goals at home, given, you know, the performance and the chances wasted from both the Blackburn game and the Stoke game. Um, but yeah, I mean, 18 minutes in, you know, we get a long throw, of course, towels are no longer allowed, but that didn't stop Darnell Furlong launching it into the box. And yeah, pinged about a bit, you know, pinball situation, as I said in the blog. And yeah, Semi Ajay, being a centre back, finished like a striker. You know, it's got to be said, I was right in that corner where it happened. You know, I was right in the corner where he came to celebrate as well. And it was like, oh my days, here we go, game on. And yeah, Semi Ajay finished like a born striker. Uh, it's got to be said from a centre back. Um, and then, of course, you know, Swansea didn't really have an answer for that in the first half. Uh, it's got to be said, out of the two teams in the first half, West Bromwich Albion were by far the better team. Um, Swansea had a few chances, but they were off target. Alex Palmer had like easy saves. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first half was all West Bromwich Albion. And, you know, I for one really didn't expect it to be that, you know, that strong of an Albion team, to be honest, especially in the first half. Because, you know, as I said, as I say in the blog, um, Swansea are kind of a bogey team for us, both home and away. Um, remember the last day of last season when they beat us uh, three goals to two, ironically. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we usually have trouble with Swansea, but to go 1 0 up, I mean, Ben Ellis said it perfect on his show last Friday morning. You know, the first goal in this game was absolutely crucial. And he wanted to see, um, you know, how Albion would fare being in the lead. Well, Ben, you know, we fared a lot better than what I think me and you were thinking. You know, I mean, I was in, during the game, I was in contact with uh, Ben through WhatsApp. And yeah, it's... Um, it was uh, an interesting uh, interesting conversation, especially when we went 1-0 up and it was like, yeah, that's the first goal. That's the crucial first goal. And, you know, let's see where we can go from here. Um, and yeah, I mean, we go into halftime 1-0, you know, and we're thinking 45 minutes just to finish the job. And do you know what? We... Almost finished the job comfortably. I'll get onto I'll get onto that a little bit later. But the uh, the corner, you know, just sent it in. Darnell Furlong, you know, smacked it off the uh, off the crossbar, and an unlucky ricochet off Rushworth um, of Swansea, and yeah, it went in. It went in off the off the back of him, and. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> I mean, Carl Rushworth, the Swansea goalkeeper, you know, he, we had something similar happen to us with Alex Palmer against Stoke, didn't we? It hit off the post, bounced off the goalkeeper, went in. Well, pretty much the same thing happened here. Darnell Furlong took the shot from the corner, um, bounced off the crossbar, hit the goalkeeper and went in. Um, so, you know, what they, what's that saying? What goes around comes around? Uh, but yeah, I mean, Carl Rushworth, I've got to be honest, was very unlucky um, with that. 
Uh, and yeah, it was literally, it was like another pinball situation. Swansea, you know, were really struggling back then with set pieces. Um, but then, you know, it was literally a game of set pieces because we end up making it 3-0 to the good after 64 minutes um, when Connor Townsend was brought down. Now, the guy had been booked before that for a tackle on Connor Townsend, but, you know, a few fans, a few Albion fans are saying that that should have been a second yellow card and he should have uh, he should have been sent off and Swansea should have been down to 10 men. Uh, you know what? After looking at the challenge on the replay, um, yeah, it was a penalty, definite. No attempt to play the ball. He really should have been sent off. But, you know, we'll take the penalty. You know, we'll take the penalty all day long. As long as the referee acknowledged that it was a penalty and it was a foul. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there was no attempt to play the ball uh, from Connor Townsend. It was a smart through ball uh, from, I think, Jed Wallace. Uh, through to Connor Townsend, but yeah, I mean, you know, come on, that really should have been. I bet it would have been a booking if he wasn't already on a yellow card. So um, yeah, uh, but then up steps John Swift, and my God, John Swift, absolute master at penalties. You know, the goalkeeper. You know, the goalkeeper guessed the right way, uh, but he really had no chance with it because it was just buried deep into the bottom right hand corner and you know all three of our goals came from set pieces you know one from a throw in one from a corner one from a penalty uh so you know all three of our goals came from set pieces it was literally a match on set pieces you know it was a match of set pieces i mean um but yeah so Everything was great after 64 minutes. You know, we was loving it. We were three 0 to the good, and then Albion does what Albion does best, and make it as nervy as they possibly can for us Baggies fans. Am I right, guys? Uh, Henry, uh, I think his name is Henry Darling. Um, yeah, Harry Darling. Sorry, uh, Harry Darling uh, headed home. Uh, from a corner and you know honestly I don't know what Kipri was doing there um, to be honest it, it looked from my angle it looked like Kipri was in front of Palmer and was blocking Palmer from getting the ball but you know I mean I had a lot of bodies between me and what actually happened so um, it looked like Kipri was like right in front of uh, Alex Palmer but yeah um it was uh it was a header um from uh harry darling uh and you know i for one four okay three one that's fine we can't keep a clean sheet at the moment that's all well and good and then nathan wood pops up with from another corner by the way with a goal with a goal it was a scrappy goal you know it was bundled in his first senior goal for Swansea um and yeah that was with 10 minutes to go and then we get the new EFL ruling about um time added on you know that was 10 minutes there was 10 minutes left of normal time when Swansea scored their second and then the ref added another nine minutes on it was the longest nine minutes of my life it's got to be said I don't know how you guys felt about that having nine minutes uh again let me know in either the chat or the uh comments below if um you know was it as nervous for you in that in that amount of added time as it was for me because all oh, my days my nerves were shredded it probably shows at the end of the vlog as well that my i was getting really nervous you know i even mentioned it in the uh in the vlog title a lot more nervy than what it should have been but yeah it was uh yeah it was nine minutes it was very nervous but i'm glad we got there in the end it's our first win of the season uh a 3-2 win at home um it might be another season of our home form you know keeping us away from the relegation zone 
but maybe our away form stops us from getting to the playoffs, just like last season, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm hoping both home form and away form, as with any fan of any team, is hoping their away form and their home form go hand in hand, you know. And it's um, it, it's really yeah. On to the next game. Uh, to be honest, I think we're away to Leeds, who lost one 0 to Birmingham. Uh, which, by the way, in Ben Ellis's prediction league, I got that absolutely spot on, and that's put me into the lead in the standings after two weekends. So, you know, thanks, Ben. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, it was uh, it was a really tense finish, wasn't it, guys? It's got to be said. Uh, and you know, our, our defence was shocking. For their two goals you know absolutely shocking uh like i said in um in the blog uh carlos corban needs to get these guys onto the training pitch this week and work on defending set pieces because you know all five goals came from set pieces swansea with their two corners uh, and obviously us with the long throw the corner and the penalty you know literally all five goals were set pieces um so yeah, if it weren't for set pieces, it would have been a bore draw, a nil-nil. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, on that note, guys, in on the subject of defence, um, it was not just for us. It was a very high-scoring weekend for some of the championship teams. I mean, I'll just run through some of the results here. Coventry beat Middlesbrough three-nil. Um, Hull beat Sheffield Wednesday four-two. An amazing game at St. Mary's, Southampton 4, Norwich 4. What was going on down there, guys, while we were fighting for our lives at the Hawthorns? Um, and yeah, Rotherham 2, Blackburn 2, which, you know, Blackburn beat us last weekend, but could only draw against Rotherham. Um, and of course, you know, Stoke having knocked us out the Carabao Cup, then go and lose to Ipswich. So that was all sorts of fun when I found that out. Uh, <laughs> no disrespect to Ipswich or Stoke with that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, we scored three goals. But Southampton, Norwich and Hull all scored four goals each. So my question to you guys is, you know, again, comment below or mention this in the live chat on the premiere uh, if you're watching the premiere. Are the championship defences, you know, getting worse than the strike? Maybe I worded that wrong, but you know, are the attackers better than the defenders in this league? Yeah, that's what I want to ask because you know, it seems like the attackers and the attacking midfielders are at the moment winning the war against the defenders because obviously, whole strikers. You know, Southampton and Norwich as well, you know, putting four goals past each other with Hull putting four past Sheffield Wednesday. You know, I mean, is there room for improvement with uh, with those teams' defences? I mean, our defence, you know, I've said all I want to say with that because Kipri, Ajay, you know, apart from the goal for Ajay, Ajay did actually well, to be honest. But yeah, Kipri, you know, he... He was poor, you know, even though we won 3-2, it was the two goals that, you know, he could have done better. Um, not that I'm singling him out. He's just the one that was like the worst offender, especially against Blackburn, you know, when he gave the winning goal away. Um, but yeah, are the defences actually getting worse, you know, or are the strikers actually getting better? You know, is it a glass half it, it, glass? Is it a glass half full, a glass half empty kind of situation here? Are the attackers getting better or are the defenders getting worse? You know, because this was a really high scoring uh, weekend for the championship. And yeah, I mean it's um it, it was a weird one. When at, after full time, you know, we were ecstatic that we held on for a free two, and then the scores flash up on the Hawthorne screens. And you see that two of the other match, one of the other matches finished 4-4. You know, uh, we already knew about the Coventry Middlesbrough result because, you know, that was the early game. Um, but yeah, as that one stands out, doesn't it? You know, Southampton 4, Norwich 4. 
Southampton were tipped, you know, along with Leicester, I think, to walk this league. Um, but they 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 only got a point. I think they came from four two behind Southampton, in fact, to draw four four. Um, so yeah, let me know, guys, what you think um has happened with you know the EFL championship teams defenses. What would you do if you was you know, say if you was manager of Norwich or manager of Southampton or manager of Sheffield Wednesday, you know, who lost 4-2 to Hull, what would you do, guys? If you had the money, you'd obviously invest in transfers um, and get a couple of new defenders in. But, you know, say if you're in a situation like us where, you know, there isn't much money to go around, um, thanks to a certain Chinese man, but, you know... <laughs> What would you do, guys? It's, um, I mean, to be honest, like I said, with, uh, with in, in the case of West Bromwich Albion, you know, we conceded two very silly set-piece goals. So I would get them onto the training pitch this week before the Leeds game and get them to defend set-pieces. It may sound simpler than what it actually is, but, you know, that's how I would feel. So let me know, guys, what would you do to shore up you know, your team's defence in this league and not concede four goals a game or three goals a game, you know. And that goes for Middlesbrough as well, to be honest, because uh, of them losing um, by three goals. So, yeah, let me know, guys, uh, what you think there. Um, and, yeah, just a, a little additional thing. Coming away from Albion uh, for the moment, uh, you may have noticed that just to my left-hand side here, is my England shirt. There's a very good reason that this is here, and that is because the Women's World Cup, England are in the final four, we are in the semi-finals, and we're facing the hosts Australia who beat France. Now, again, going back to Friday morning on Ben's show, uh, because he did a little bit on this as well, um, I actually said the the main danger in our half of the bracket was France. If we could somehow avoid France, then I could see us going to the final. I still stand by that. And sure enough, yes, it was through penalties. Australia won 7-6 on penalties. But Australia did phenomenal keeping that score down to 0-0 in 120 minutes. Because I was actually tipping France to win that. And how wrong was I? You know, I mean, Australia win on penalties. Congrats to the Matildas. And yeah, we'll see you in the semi-final on Wednesday, I believe. Um, so yeah, England versus Australia in the semi-final. And, you know, I mean, we... Uh, we, we, we didn't make it as tough as we did against Nigeria. You know, we, we scraped through with Nigeria, it's got to be said, with the penalty shootout. Um, but this one, you know, yes, OK, we went 1-0 down. Uh, you know, Colombia scored just before half-time. Uh, but then, you know, well, they scored just before injury time in the first half. Uh, and then, you know, that didn't last long because uh, Love and Hemp poked in the equaliser you know, and it was it was a really awesome goal. You know, we thought we were going into half time one nil down. You know, and I think if we did go into half time one nil down, then Colombia might have gotten stronger, and we would have found it very dif difficult to get through. Um, but Lauren Hem poked in the equaliser. We got into half time at one one, and then I think that was the turning point when we equalised. Because Alessa Russo, the Arsenal striker, man, she's only scored once in four World Cup matches prior to Saturday. But, you know, it was it was a deflection. You know, she pounced on a deflection. You know, Colombia were really unlucky. Um, but, yeah, she did well to be alert and, um, you know, pounce in and score what eventually came to be the winning goal for England. And, yeah, 
into the semi-finals, final four, we're against Australia for a place in the Women's World Cup final. I'm looking forward to that one. I am honestly looking forward to that one. Hopefully the Lionesses can do it, you know, against the Matildas. And, you know, I know they're the hosts, but we had this a couple of years ago, didn't we? well, more than a couple of years ago, when Canada was hosting the Women's World Cup and we beat them. So the omens are good. We are good at beating host nations in World Cups uh, because we beat Canada and then went on to lose in the semi-final against Japan, who then in turn went on to lose to USA in the semi-final. I think they got absolutely destroyed by six or seven nil in the World Cup final then that year. Not sure what year that is, but yeah. Um, and obviously in the third place playoff, we beat Germany to go third. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, good luck to the Lionesses. Let's hope we can get into the uh, the final. Um, England are guaranteed two more games in this World Cup. Um, the semi-final against Australia. And then depending on how that goes, we've got either the World Cup final or the third place playoff. Hopefully the World Cup final. So good luck, girls. We're all rooting for you. And yeah, I mean, it was it was absolutely awesome to, uh, to see. Um, England do well. Now, uh, on to the team focus for this week. Now, you've noticed that I haven't got a guest, but that hasn't stopped me getting a team focus on. I have asked a very good friend of mine. Um, he is a Wolves fan, so be kind to him. Uh, <laughs> so he's going to be talking a little bit on the uh, situation at Wolverhampton. And... Yeah, I mean, he's pre-recorded this, guys, um, because he wasn't available to talk to talk to me like at the time of this recording, um, because he's like busy with his stuff. He is a sports presenter for local TV, or in these parts, you know it as Birmingham TV, uh, Channel Seven on Freeview, and yeah, he uh, he covers um, most of the uh, sports. Um, section on their news uh, program uh, around here it's called your West Midlands tonight but obviously you know if you're in Liverpool it's like your Merseyside tonight um, or you know Newcastle uh, uh, it's like your Tyneside tonight or something like that but we know it as your West Midlands tonight uh, because obviously we're local to Birmingham it's on Birmingham TV part of the local TV network which I have done podcasts for you know podcast episodes for and that's why i've gotten into podcasting myself because of you know contributing to the local tv network so here is um charles Haig jones uh wolves fan so be kind and yeah he's going to talk a little bit about uh the situation going on at wolves so take it away charles Hello, uh, Charles A. Jones, local TV sports video journalist here. And today I'm taking a more fan view on things for um, the Halford Lanes podcast. Um, team focus this week. I'm a Wolves fan, so it's good to sort of have some differentiating from, you know, being a reporter and being a bit more neutral to actually being able to have my say on, on the club that I love and follow and have done for most of my life um so first to you know something that would probably be be talked about quite a lot is, is Lopetegui um now obviously departure has been confirmed he was odds on as the the first manager the favorite to leave the club first uh in the Premier League this season the first manager to leave their club uh so if you put a bet on that you're probably coming in with a bit of money now um not that much because the odds were quite low now on Lopetegui, um, personally for me, he's the reason Wolves are a Premier League club. I probably made that clear, you know, incredible turnaround, um, 40 plus points, bottom, bottom at Christmas. I know we had the World Cup break, but it was an incredibly poor season. And let's not get this wrong. It, it hasn't just been last season when the Bruno Large, it's been going on for quite a while now at the club, I think since that Nuno era came to an end, um, 
and Wolves never really recovered from the COVID pandemic. They were really, really peaking just before the COVID pandemic, the COVID situation. Um, so that fell at a really, really bad time for the club. Uh, Bruno Large came in with Nuno's system, Nuno's players tried to do something different. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of fans actually forget that under Bruno Large, it was around February time of, of no, not not the season just gone, the season before that. Wolves could have had fourth place. Wolves could, Wolves could have had the top five in the Premier League. Uh, however, let it slip on multiple occasions. It was away at Arsenal, then a uh, home to Leeds, and from there it just sort of slowly, slowly depreciated. Uh, Lopetegui came in saved a, a, a certain sinking ship to the championship um so for that he'll always have my respect i think an incredible character an incredible manager um but having said that you know on on paper probably one of the greatest managers Wolves have ever had as a club in terms of his achievements his personal abilities and you know what he's achieved elsewhere but looking at his record he didn't stay at Real Madrid for long. He didn't stay at the Spain job for long. He didn't really stay at Sevilla for long, even though they won the, the Europa League as well. So, you know, I think maybe some Wolves fans were masked by that. They sort of forgot that Lopetegui's not really a long-term manager. He comes in, does a job, or comes in and maybe gets things wrong and then makes his way out. And, and it happened at Wolves. He saved them from relegation. An incredible, incredible achievement. He could certainly... Even got manager of the season. That's how much of a big achievement it was, um, and then things just weren't right. And, and my f feelings on the situation. I mean, I spoke to him a few times at press conferences. Um, you know, whenever asked about transfers and and who's going to bring in, who's the squad? Is the squad good enough for next season? Um, it was always, I'm not the financial director. I don't know and. It was almost as if he was shooting down journalists for asking questions about, you know, signings and stuff, which is completely our job. Um, but he sort of took it as, I don't, I don't know, I can't really speak on this because I haven't got a clue about the financial situation. So there was something clearly there from the start playing on his mind. Um, and was it a case of Fos and the ownership sort of telling him one thing and it being another from the outside looking in, it certainly looks like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a tough situation to see him go, especially three or four days before a new Premier League season. Now, that is really not ideal. Um, but yeah, we've got to move on. Wolves have got to move on and look ahead. Now, the financial situation is not good. It, it never has been good. Uh, since after January, pretty much in the open letter to fans from Jeff Shee, it was said that we had this money for the summer and it's basically been spent in January in order to keep us up. And at the end of the day, the additions, Cunha, Sarabia, Joel Gomez, uh, Craig Dawson and Mario Lamina, those five played a huge, huge part in keeping Wolves in the Premier League. Um, so let's move on. You know, Gary O'Neill, in my opinion, did a fantastic job at Bournemouth. Everyone wrote them off. You know, we've seen the, the sort of social media content and the chat about it, that everyone had them pinned to go down. And why wouldn't you really? Let's be honest, they didn't have much going for them. Um, Gary O'Neill, untested really in the managerial department, did an incredible job um, to get them playing. You know, good for, they had some very good results, obviously beat Wolves. Um at the Molyneux, you know, stuff like that. They beat Spurs, I believe. They, they beat Chelsea. They had some fantastic results. And to be sacked was a shock. I think a lot of people were thinking, hold on, why have they why have they sacked him? But he looks positive. The way I'm looking at it as a fan is I'd rather have a manager who's in the job and committed and wants to do the job and knows what he wants, knows his situation, than a manager who's probably better on paper, but maybe is a bit fed up, doesn't see the, the long-term project, doesn't understand uh, where it could go. Um, so Gary O'Neill, in his first few words for the club, is looking good. 
it, it's positive you know he, he understands that it's not going to be the easiest of situations it's certainly certainly not at Wolves um, and you know he's obviously pointing out the obvious that three or four days before Wolves travel to Man United on their opener uh, he's been brought in and it's it's new it's you know that is you can't really comprehend the the challenge he's got to face now as a, as a Premier League manager um, but you know, constantly you're looking at this wolf side, and you you do think it's a good team on paper. You know, if you can get them playing, there are certainly three worst teams on paper. Now, I hate that saying on paper because it doesn't really mean anything. Um, but if we can get them playing at some level, some standard, and maintain it, improve the away form, I think Wolves will just be okay. Um, no, yeah, going on. To, I mean, the squad's the squad's good enough. However, it's those dreaded injuries. If if, for example, you, you look at Max Kilman, if he put, picks up a knock, it's right back to square one, really, for Wolves. Um, and it's sort of a terrible situation to be in. So we've got to hope that they stay fit. And it looks like Wolves have a fully fit squad for the first time in a long time, which is actually very, very pleasing. Um, it's something that you know. It was tough under Nuno. There was quite a few injuries there, but under Bruno, the the, the injuries were were very plentiful, um, and under Lopetegui as well. So, whilst there may not be more faces coming in the door for Wolves, we've just got to accept the situation and look at the the here and the now. We are a Premier League club. We are looking forward to a new season in the Premier League in England's top flight, in the best league in the world. Um, so we've got to make the most of it. We've got to enjoy it while we're still here. Or as, you know, Jonathan as a, as a West Bromwich Albion fan, you know how, and me as a Wolves fan myself, you know how harsh football can be. And you go right from the top and all of a sudden, you know, you are sort of deadwood in the championship. and You don't want to be in that situation. But, you know, the money that's in football it, coming from other clubs and other owners nowadays, it is so, so hard to maintain your stay in the top flight. So... You know, we've got to accept it. Wolves fans have got to accept it. On to Man United. Couldn't really be a, a tougher start unless it was City away or Liverpool or Arsenal, really. Those three. But United, incredible under Eric Ten Hag at home. They've not really put a foot wrong at home um, since he took over. So I'm not expecting Wolves to go and control the game and, you know, pick things apart. But if we can just slowly grow into it, get some spells going, start to look good in front of goal, look comfortable on the ball. You never know in these games. Um, however, as tough as it might sound, a 2-0 loss now is probably not as bad as it could be. So hopefully avoiding that. Um, very, very tough fixtures we've also got. Um, so we need to start strong. We just need to show that we've got intent because we've got the players and we need the fans to get behind us um, and we can go from there. So hopefully Wolves can just put on a bit of a bit of a front really and show that the rest of the teams around that we're not going to be down there this season. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my perspective as a Wolves fan. Um, it's going to be another long season. There's no doubt about that. It's just can we stay positive? Can we keep going? Um, but, yeah, thanks for having me on this and. Chatting about Wolves as a fan is something I don't really get to do as much anymore. So, yeah. Cheers, guys. Thank you. And that's Charles Hay jones guys. Uh, thank you for that, um, mate. You know, really appreciate that uh, video. And, you know, good luck. Uh, I would like to say good luck to... Um... <laughs> it's, as an Albion fan, it's very difficult for me to say good luck to Wolves. But, you know... They are against Manchester United uh, at Old Trafford, and they do kick off tonight. Pretty much not long after this episode, uh, you know, this episode ends. So, yeah, good luck to them tonight. Um, although, to be honest, I am kind of hoping that Man United do get something off you. Uh, but that's just the Albion fan in me talking. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you for that, Charles. And, um, yeah, I mean, what a great video uh, to explain everything that's going on at Wolves. I mean, the uh, the Lopetegui uh, departure, 
you know, literally four days before the Premier League season and, um, you know, and O'Neill coming in, you know, after having a great spell at Bournemouth. Um, that's going to be really interesting um, to see how that pans out from uh, the Wolves down the road. And, yep, yeah, so, um, I mean, I was hoping to get Ben Ellis on here to give his thoughts on um, Newcastle 5, Aston Villa 1. But, um, you know, he's uh, he was a little bit too busy working on his own radio show um, to uh, to actually contribute to something. But that's fine. You know, it's a it's a choice to come on here. You know, if if it's um, if you're too busy, that's fine. But, you know, it's it, it's um, like I said, there's going to be episodes like this where I've got literally no one recording here with me. But yeah, I mean, thank you so much for watching, guys. Uh, if you like this podcast and you want to hear more, then please, please, please leave a like. Subscribe to Crazy Shadow Talks Football if you haven't already done so. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to join the Shadow Squad and get notified on all new contents on the channel. Um, and yet, yeah, don't forget to follow my other social media platforms, which are Twitter or X, at Crazy Shadow 303, uh, my Twitch channel where I do all my gaming, Crazy Shadow Gameplays, uh, my Facebook page, Crazy Shadow 303, and my Discord as well. Um, called the Shadow Server, where I update you, update people on, you know, all the new content and where to find it. And also, I've got like a little Sun Dream Team League going on in my Discord as well, which will have like weekly updates on it as well. So if you're interested in joining, um, just go to the Sun Dream Team website, dreamteamfc.com, create your team, and then you know, join the Discord and register your interest and I'll get you joined up into the league. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I know this was a little bit different from the previous two episodes, but, you know, people have lives outside of, uh, outside of podcasting. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for watching, guys. And, oh, don't forget to listen at 9.40 a.m. every Friday for Super Switch on Switch Radio 107.5 FM DAB and online switchradio.co.uk to hear my predictions. As it stands, I am top of the leaderboard with six points. And I got all six of those points from the weekend just gone because I correctly predicted Blues to win 1-0. I predicted Newcastle to win, I predicted us to win, and I predicted Soli or Moors to win. So I got a point out of every game that was put to me, you know, at least a point. So absolutely awesome. And yeah, like I said, I'm top of the leaderboard. Long may that continue, although my predictions are either very accurate or nowhere near. So <laughs> so yeah, if you could uh, give a listen to Ben Ellis's breakfast show, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. every Monday to Friday. Um, but obviously, my bit on Super Switch is every Friday morning from about 9.40, uh, 20, to, 20 to 10 in the morning on Fridays. So thanks so much for watching, guys. Hope you stay safe and you're doing well. And, yeah, all i got to say now is bring on leads, <laughs> you know, Thanks so much for watching. Boing, boing. Come on, you baggies. And yeah, bye for now, guys.